We're smoothly going to our next round table discussion with PhD holders working in European companies and institutions. We're just me missing one. Um... Lisa Di Nuovo, Carol Cravero, Alessandro Di Baratore, and uh, Michael Julo. We're just missing Alessandro, but maybe we can start. We can then... start, we can start. So um, I'm really, really happy, happy and honored to, 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 to moderate uh, our round tables. And uh, uh, let me express my gratitude for our PhD graduates uh, uh, joining us now. Uh, one of, uh, of, of the goal of our doctoral school is always to, uh, to um, uh, keep track, to track the career of our PhD holder, to, to, to see uh, if the PhD represented for them an added value, what are they are doing today, uh, if, uh, if PhD leads uh, so, to, to a, a better career. And I, the, the answer is yes, uh, is, uh, because we, we show, we demonstrate it concretely. And let's start with Carol Cravero. Uh, she, she is the testimonial also for, for Cotutel, for Cotutel thesis, so a, a binational uh, uh, PhD thesis. She, she got a degree, a PhD in sustainable public procurement, and she, she embarked for an international career after uh, many, many international experience. This is the key, I would say, the key message of, of her speech. And now she's working, she has a position at the World Trade Organization in Geneva. So tell, thank you for telling us something about your, your story, your background, what are you doing now? How could you, could you get this position? And uh, what would you, would you suggest? What would you suggest to our freshly uh, graduated PhD? Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, Lucia, for uh, inviting me and for this kind of introduction. I will try to tell my story in a couple of words, maybe a little bit more than a couple, because I did a, quite a lot of things in the same time at the same time. So basically, um, I have a degree in law uh, from the University of Turin in 2012. Uh, then I passed my bar exam in 2015 after two uh, internships. Uh, one at a criminal court and the other one uh, in a law firm. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I started uh, some uh, international consultancies uh, for the International Training Center of the International Labor Organization, which is the ITC ILO in Turin. Uh, and basically, it was for a master program in sustainable public procurement, uh, Le Marche Public Durable. Um, so this, is, uh, this was uh, uh, mainly for uh, Africa French speaking countries. Uh, and uh, let's say that over, the, over time, uh, during uh, these eight years of, of consultancies, I um, had a kind of feeling. So I felt that there was a, a missing piece of uh, the puzzle of my career, and that missing piece was a PhD. So I decided to start my PhD in 2017, so more or less five years after my degree in law, uh, because I thought that uh, for me to be recognized as an expert in the field, it was a very important step. Uh, I decided to um, uh, have this, uh, to enroll in this uh, joint program, uh, University of Turin and University of Paris, Paris 10. And it was uh, really a great experience. Uh, I tried to um, assist uh, and follow many conferences and workshops uh, just to build my own network as it was also advised uh, in the beginning of this uh, event. Um, and um, over time, I had the opportunity to get a new consultancy for the African Development Bank uh, for the public procurement law reform in Senegal. And after this one, I spent uh, four months uh, in uh, Ouagadougou, the capital city of uh, Burkina Faso, as uh, an individual consultant of the Ministry of Finance and Economy of Burkina Faso to carry out their uh, public procurement law reform in order to incorporate sustainability criteria. 
and I was also a little bit lucky, let's say, um, as, uh, as someone told before, you sh you have to be uh, at the good, uh, at the right spot, and uh, at the right moment. So I um, I've knew I knew uh, that uh, I was selected for this uh, current position at the WTO in December 2021. Uh, so I started this new contract. Uh, I have a, a shorter term contract, so less than uh, one year. Uh, I'm working as a legal affairs officer at the World Trade Organization. As you can see from my background, I'm working specifically on government procurement. So this is my field. Um, and we have a treaty on this. So basically my activity is to assist and advise governments, uh, representatives of different governments, parties to our agreement in their negotiation process. And what I really like is the fact that I'm at the heart of the multilateralism where decision should be taken and sometimes are taken. Um, and so governments and representatives have to sit down around the table, discuss, exchange, find a compromise and find an agreement, a reach an agreement whenever possible, even on sensitive issues like sustainability. So sorry if I uh, if it was a little bit long, uh, but I wanted to just to uh, share my my story. Um, I don't know if you have uh, more questions for me, uh, Lucia. Yeah. So one question is uh, uh, how? What are the skills? The skills uh, you acquired during your PhD? You think I think that international the take home home message, listen to you is an international experience. Pay, pays off uh, in your case, the PhD, PhD and an international experience because you, your PhD was also a co to tell a binational. Yeah. So what are the skills you think that helped you to, to, to arrive to get such, a, such an interesting and important position? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a, a very good uh, question. In fact, I have to admit that I have learned a lot from my PhD, for instance, uh, how to take uh, criticism, because as you know, uh, a thesis is not only the result of your own research, but also of others' constructive criticism or uh, comments, feedbacks. So how to handle with these uh, criticism or feedbacks, uh, how to get stronger uh, whenever you receive a criticism, uh, how to convey messages in a clear and hopefully concise way, uh, how to stand up for your position. These are uh, important skills that I acquired uh, during my PhD. And um, what about the network? So the network was in person. How would you uh, rate and the importance of, of, of and the network in your career development. <laughs> It's uh, very important uh, um, because um, in, in the past, uh, what I was used to do was to share my uh, CV with some colleagues uh, and then uh, with my network, uh, because what I think is that uh, opportunities do exist and there are a lot of opportunities across the world, but sometimes we don't know that they exist or on the contrary, recruiters don't know that there is a good fit somewhere in the world. Um, so it's very important to have a network and uh, my network was important, especially for my consultancy activities. It was really a very important uh, part of my yeah. career. Uh, there is a, a chat. So what about the recruitment process? How, how can you apply for, for a position in uh, the World Trade Organization? Because it is, is difficult for, for, extra, for us uh, working in a completely different context to how to to, to yes. arrive there. <laughs> Yes, the, uh, each uh, international organization has uh, its own portal. Um, uh, so you have uh, one for the UN system, one for the WTO. Uh, in this portal, all uh, vacancies are published. So you can uh, have a look at all of them. And uh, if you are interested in some of them, you can apply. So the recruitment, uh, the recruitment process uh, uh, is a little bit complex in the sense that it's a multi-step process. So first, First of all, once you are interested in one of them, you have to send your CV through this portal. 
Um, if you are selected, then after a couple of months, uh, there's a written exam. The written exam is usually based uh, on the position itself, so it's content-based. To give you an example, in my case, it was on sustainable public procurement. If you pass this written exam, then there's a, a, an oral exam after a couple of months again. Uh, the oral exam can be um, made up of different uh, sub-steps. One of them is a short presentation, usually a 10 minutes uh, presentation. You are given the topic the night before or even a couple of hours before the oral exam. So you have little time to get prepared. But I would say that the most challenging part, at least to me was to answer these difficult questions on soft skills. They are usually very interesting in, know, uh, in knowing how you deal with different difficult situations. For instance, you can be asked uh, how uh, you can uh, how you have dealt with uh, a difficult conversation with a colleague, mm -hmm. or whenever you receive a bad criticism or a negative criticism. What is your reaction? Well, whenever you receive this kind of question, uh, you don't have have to, um, let's say, provide a kind of statement, but you should be able to provide a concrete example, a kind of scenario with a lot of details. Um, so if you, if you are not able to provide a concrete example, because for instance, you have never experienced before this or that situation, you can also uh, be honest and say, well, it never happened to me, but in the case, I would act in this or that way. Uh, the most important thing to know is that there is no one single answer that is okay, that is acceptable. Uh, they just want to know how you can deal with difficult situations. Mm -hmm. Soft skills. So, so, so you see that uh, the importance of the, to, to train. So you have to be prepared. Uh, yes, indeed. And uh, by the way, uh, there's a, uh, this a website of uh, the UN system, uh, which is called uh, Inspira, I-N-S-P-I-R-A. Uh, and you can find a lot of videos, uh, tutorials and guidelines on how to deal with this difficult uh, selection process. Okay, maybe at the end of your presentation, could you Put it in the chat because sure, yes. it's very interesting. And uh, to last very, very quick questions so of pros and yeah. cons of your position, of your work, because you decided to, to move to, to other contexts, to, to also to, to live abroad. And a, a, a final tip in, in two free words, maximum three words. Yes, uh, I will start with uh, the first question. Um, there's uh, there are a lot of positive aspects uh, in doing this kind of job. Um, even if uh, um, sometimes I miss a little bit the research, so I'm not able to say what the future will bring. Uh, so let's see, I'm just trying to enjoy also this experience as much as I can and learn a lot because we can always improve and always learn from all experiences. Um, in three words, uh, I will say resilience, never give up. Um, in my case, uh, I... I, how can I put it? Uh, I try to apply for different positions and I also received, of course, as everyone does, I received uh, a lot of uh, emails of rejection and this might be frustrating and it was frustrating for me as well, but I try to not to see this as a failure, but more as um, a, an opportunity to rework my CV because basically um, it's not only a matter of who you are, what you can do, but it's also a, a matter of how you explain this. Uh, so um, this is, uh, yes, my key message. Thank you, thank you so much, and thank you for thank writing you. in the chat. Uh, yes, sure. uh, because it will be of great, uh, of great help. And now we have Alessandro Liberatore, huge big thanks for, for another reason because he woke very early, woke up very early. He is now in Pasadena, and it is very early in the morning. So <laughs> we are really grateful. <laughs> Our gratitude goes to Alessandro for joining us to join. And uh, he, Alessandro, PhD in physics and astrophysics. 
postdoctoral research fellow at the NAC NASA in Italian with Jet Propulsion Laboratory in the United States, Pasadena. And so tell, thank you for telling us something about your uh, uh, postdoctoral career. But how, how could you get uh, a position as a research fellow? in there, what are you doing, what are the perspective uh, and uh, the skills, uh, uh, the most required, the, the, the most required skills for your uh, current position and, and the final tip. Okay, hello everyone. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present myself and my, uh, my career, my academic career. And yeah, I'm Today, uh, my academic career starts uh, in Turin with a bachelor degree in physics. And just after my PhD, my bachelor degree in physics, I did uh, an internship in, um, at KTH in uh, Stockholm, in Sweden. It's still in physics, working on what will be my uh, master thesis uh, focus on astroparticle physics. Then I start my uh, master degree uh, still in Turin, I come back to Turin, uh, working on particle physics, where I had the, the chance to perform a new internship. And so you can already start probably uh, to understand a key point in my opinion that is the international that are the international experience and during the, this new internship i work in Kosice, slovakia the space department the space physics department uh, working on what will be uh, the the field of research of my uh, phd that is focused on uh, that was focused on the heliophysics so the interaction between the, the sun and uh, the heart in, in my particular case. Uh, indeed, during my PhD, I PhD performed at the National Institute of, Institute of Astrophysics in uh, close to Turin, in Pino Torinese, working at the observatory of Pino Torinese. And there I had the opportunity to uh, develop my skills, skills that were ex extremely necessary for my actual position that were uh, for sure the um, ability of work with different tools, uh, IT tools, so different programming languages, and also um, deal with uh, different problems. Every day there was a, a different problem to deal with from an experimental point of view and a theoretical point of view. Uh, indeed, uh, peculiarities of my actual position uh, in JPL is that there, there is a very dynamic environment. Every day you do something different, of course, focus on the project you're working on and you must be prepared. So problem solving skills are very fundamental for uh, those are interested in, in this kind of job. And you also uh, should be prepared to a very, and this is probably, I don't know if it's pros or cons, but um, is ugly competitive environment. Uh, every week you have to demonstrate that um, what you did in the, during the week, but uh, is compared with, strongly compared with what is performed by other stud, stud, uh, students at your same level. And the contracts, there are different contract, uh, contracts in, uh, in JPL, but the most common ones are the one plus one plus one. So every year, uh, both you and, uh, and JPL must be on the same line and decide to continue. So um, there is a, yeah, an ideal, ideal competitive environment, definitely. And I said, uh, making international experience with uh, in several, uh, I would say, uh, with different people can uh, definitely be useful. For example, um, to apply for GPL, you need three um, reference letters at least. 
and of course it is important who uh, can write to you these uh, letters and during my PhD, during my master degree and phd i had the opportunity for example to work with an astronaut uh, and with also um, isa people isa is the european space agency and you have to demonstrate with to these people that you uh, have the possibility to work with that you are good in at your work so make your uh, network because it's fundamental <laughs> and i think that uh, in a nutshell you could you have just to dare mighty things <laughs> because um, sometimes people say no uh, i cannot apply to this position because it's it's too much for me. It it it, it doesn't exist. It's never it, it, nothing is too much for you. You have just to believe in yourself and try. In the worst case, you just um, try an, another an, a new job interview, and you just you can just develop your skills in job interviews. So try and believe in yourself. Uh, maybe. Um how could you um, get this position i mean uh, was network I, uh, useful for you uh, how could you define this such a yeah i found this position because there was an internal uh, mail at the uh, at the national institute of astrophysics where i performed my phd where uh, they asked for um, uh, a postdoctoral fellow in um, in astrophysics at JPL. And then I checked online uh, the details about this, this position, in particular on LinkedIn. And, and then I decided to apply. I, I saw that there was something like already, I don't, I don't know, 10, it seems, uh, person that applied in, in a few. Um, and my network was extremely useful for two main uh, reasons. One is because, uh, as I said before, there was it was necessary to have some um, letters from from them. I had to I had someone I, I needed someone to to ask for this letter to um, that can can guarantee for me, and. Another important reason is that um, in, for my particular case, I had to demonstrate that I can give them something more uh, cooperating with others. For example, they need some data, some experiences that uh, just the Italian group in this case had. And I focus my attention on this, uh, on this pros because if uh, I could work with JPL, I uh, could help them uh, with some data that otherwise they uh, were take a, a lot of time to uh, be, be analyzed. And that's the, the two main reasons. Of course, uh, there will be also uh, other ones, but for me, there were the, the two main ones. And what about, so two last questions, um, what about the recruitment process? How did it work? Sure. Uh, for, for, for if there is someone listening to you now who would like uh, to, 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 yeah. to try and, and a final key message uh, you could give uh, to young PhD students at the end of their career PhD program and in search of uh, uh, positions. Yeah, there's um, a link online uh, that is called uh, NASA Research uh, Position. And it's not just for JPL that is uh, part of NASA, but there are different uh, uh, centers. And you can saw there all the vacancies, the open vacancies uh, to, to apply. And once you apply, they, you should, again, send your CV, of course, uh, and uh, the, the recommendation letters, then there will there will be a first screening on the prerequisite. And then in my case, there were uh, two um, interviews online. Uh, the first one more fo uh, focused on my past. So what I did, my experience, 
And the second one uh, was more about uh, what I can do for JPL. Uh, why me? And this again is about what I said before. So the importance of networking. And this was my, in, in my case, the, the process. I'm not sure that if uh, this is the same for uh, every position, but I think that for a postdoc postdoctoral fellow is almost the same. Uh, in a nutshell, I think that uh, my tip would be uh, make international experience. I think that was the, the key feature of my uh, CV that was really relevant for uh, for win this position. Uh, I had have very uh, I have a lot of international experience and experiences, and I think that uh, are the key definitely to uh, be able to uh, win different position, especially outside uh, Italy. I mean, the, your country, <laughs> of course. Yes, yes, and so uh, well, I think that. Uh... <clears throat> it's, uh, it is crystal clear that uh, uh, to arrive to get such a position, you prepared, uh, you, you had a particular survey. Uh, so it, it's a journey, it's like a self journey, but it's really PhD and the, the preparation of your career. It's mm -hmm. uh, it's a journey. And uh, so our take home message today, today was also another one. You can do whatever you want with your PhD uh, if you decide to move uh, uh, to other contexts. For you, it's research, but not, not in academic, real, so academic context. Thank you, Alexa Alessandro. Maybe thank you if you can reply to our question in, in the chat. You can, you can, if you can reply, thank you so much. And uh, uh, now uh, we we have Elisa Di Nuovo, PhD. Oh, this just in brackets. I, I, I we decided to invite also a representative, a testimonial for humanities. If PhD is poorly understood uh, or regarded in uh, outside the uh, academia in Italy. For humanities, it's even more difficult to, to, to demonstrate that PhD is an added value, and even to, 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 to build, even to build a, a, a professional profile, it's really difficult. But Elisa Di Nuovo is, is a, 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 the example of a success story because with her PhD in digital humanities, so an interdisciplinary uh, PhD, innovation language professional, she is now an innovation, she's working at the European Parliament, so an international career again innovation language professional speech to text um, at, at the European Parliament and so thank you for, for uh, telling us something more about your background how could you get such an interest interesting position what are you do concretely doing at the European Parliament with your uh, uh, background uh, was your PhD a, a, a precondition or an asset, asset and what, what advice would you give to uh, your colleague, your young colleagues? Okay. Thank you, Lucia, for your kind introduction. So as you said, I'm working at the European Parliament in Luxembourg. Right now I'm in Turin instead because just yesterday I defended my PhD thesis that was uh, in uh, digital humanities. And uh, yeah, usually PhDs, uh, if you have a PhD in something related to humanities, it's very hard to find a position in uh, industry or in institutions. But I have to say I was in the right place at the right time because uh, to, to get this position, I just replied to an email that was sent to my, to, to my research group here in Turin. They were looking for a computational linguist. And uh, then I had two interviews. I had, of course, to send the CV. And then after two interviews and uh, maybe two months to hand in all the documentations that they need to verify if you can actually be uh, the person they are looking for. 
then uh, I was there. And I was there after I, the day after I finished my scholarship. Um, they waited for me because they were looking for someone just before. And um, they were so happy to have me because I'm not, as you said, it's, uh, it was my study was an interdisciplinary one. So I joined my passion for linguistics with what it is very popular nowadays, that is computer science. So my PhD was in between computer science and uh, linguistics and foreign languages. So I had to learn a lot by myself because usually, at least in my PhD, there is no one there uh, teaching you what to do and you have to uh, find courses that can be helpful for you. But it was very highly rewarding because now I'm in Luxembourg. I, I am in charge of the evaluation of a tool. Uh, this tool is able to perform in real time speech machine translation. This means that it is used uh, uh, for accessibility reasons and uh, it allows people who are deaf on, or hard of hearing to follow in real time plenary sessions that usually happens in Strasbourg. And thanks to this tool, they can read the translation into their native language because the tool currently uh, works with the 19 languages, but at the end of the next year, it will cover all the 24 official languages of the European Union. I don't know if I answered all your questions. Yes, so I have one, so one question. So I, when we decided to invite Elisa, we found her, her position, her, professional profile very interesting because uh, you think European Parliament, maybe you, you, you we, we, I, I was thinking about translation, translator, on the contrary, uh, she, uh, she's, She's also a technician somehow for what she is doing, and it, so she is the demonstrate. She, she can demonstrate, or PhD can demonstrate uh, uh, the employability for for humanities <laughs> as well. In in, in any way, if you are highly skilled, uh, you 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 can get this kind of. Well, nowadays, you can have the same skills doing a master's degree, a master degree because. Uh, in Italy, uh, nowadays, some universities offer courses that are in computational linguistics, which is the subject that I studied during my PhD. And nowadays, a lot of companies hire computational linguists. So if you are, a, if you are passionate of linguistics, then if you add the computational side then for sure it's easier to find a job. Yes, may our alumni, our PhD graduates might also help us to better explore job opportunities outside academia. So um, digital humanities is an in interdisciplinary PhD uh, combat where, where linguistics, linguistics is combined with uh, uh, computer science, and that's how you could easily found uh, with such high uh, skills uh, your um, disposition. Uh, and but it was you, you were asked uh, for for this position was the PhD a prerequisite requisite or were you uh, or, or was it an asset? No, it was an asset. Actually, an asset. my position, the prerequisite is just a bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. But in Italy, there are not bachelor degrees in computational linguistics. There are some masters that are starting like this year in uh, Pisa, I guess, or maybe in Padua. There is so also something, but not in all the cities in uh, Italy. And uh, I knew that in other countries, like in Spain, they had these courses just 
uh, already five years ago. So what they needed was a computational linguist because it was necessary to have the knowledge of artificial intelligence and deep learning in order to be able to understand what mm -hmm. we can uh, achieve with these tools, what we can ask to the external company who is developing this tool. Um, yeah, and also to run some com compute some metrics in order to automatically uh, evaluate this tool. But of course, since we are at the European Parliament, we don't we don't only we we don't use only automatic metrics, but also uh, human evaluation because we work with our translators in order to evaluate, evaluate and have uh, confirmation from translators about the quality. Just reading uh, commentary, this is a real example of, a, of a opportunity creation, opportunity use, so exciting example like it. Uh, your final key message, your, your final if I tip, a tip, uh, what, what advice, what, what kind of advice would you give to uh, your colleague, your young colleagues and uh, um, tips for early career researchers planning an international mobility? Mm. About the second question, really, I don't know. But for the first one, I can say that if you want to work, for example, at the European Parliament and uh, you are not lucky enough like me to receive just a mail and they are looking for you, right, you, then you can apply for an internship because uh, each year there are two rounds of uh, internships in the European Parliament. It is called Schumann Traineeship program and uh, you can uh, have you can uh, work there for five months and if you are good usually uh, you can find a place there so the majority of my colleagues uh, have started uh, being trainees and now they have contracts and um, but this is good news this is good yeah. news so there is hope there is hope for so permanent position for for humanities uh, Okay. For research at, at the European Parliament, there is uh, an, institution, an institutional directorate called the EPRS, who deals with research because um, of maybe course... Maybe could you, could you put it in the chat, Elisa? Yes. Because sure. maybe people can take notes. And so And thank you. It is very interesting, but we have another, uh, the, our last speaker. So, and you know, we have uh, uh, to... Not to run, we don't have to run out of time. So thank you so much, Elisa, if you can write in the chat so people can take notes. And so Michael, I'm just leaving the floor to Michael Julot, PhD doctor in materials engineering, global account manager at Automotive Europe. So another field, a completely different field. And so, but very interesting as well. So thank you so much for telling something more about your background, your current position, if your PhD was an asset or a prerequisite, what are the skills the most in demand in your field? And if you're hiring, hiring, what are the position offered to PhD? And your final tip of your final so key message, uh, general key message and what are, um, okay, thank you. Good evening, can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. okay, good. So good evening, everybody. Thanks a lot um, for the invitation and the opportunity indeed to, to talk about my experience. And I remember some 18 years ago when I was a PhD, for sure, I would have appreciated this kind of a, of, um, of a conference. So yes, a uh, long time ago, I had a PhD in material science in Grenoble area. So very close to the apps. Uh, in microelectronics. Uh, then I started a little bit working still in microelectronics, uh, having, uh, I would say, the usual way of move to professional life from a PhD, uh, which is I started to work on my PhD topic. So directly involved as a project manager for to develop my project uh, with a specific tool supplier. 
uh, and then I started to move to a completely different world, moving to Italy and moving to uh, to automotive world, uh, starting to work as a quality manager, um, European quality manager, then moved to uh, the dark side of uh, the moon and moving to commercial position, uh, being an affiliate uh, Italian territory manager. And then uh, now I was a global account manager because I just left my position and decided to go back to my previous passion, which is innovation and go back to uh, to support people to, to work in innovation. So fresh and new from a few days ago. Um, so for sure, I had the two cases in my professional life. The one that is very unusual that I had the opportunity to work directly in the field where I was an expert, which is really, to be honest, uh, everybody have to be realistic. It's a very, very narrow chance after your PhD to find something that is exactly fitting what is your expertise. So probably you will not work in your expertise. You will work in something else and you have a lot of talents to do that. And, and you are prepared to do that. You are not... Probably you are not aware of that, but you are ready to do that. Uh, and then I moved to something that is, was completely different. But nevertheless, using what, what I learned and why, what I developed during my PhD, um, all of all PhD, who some are a little bit more lucky, some are a little bit less, but you will face some troubles, unexpected troubles. You will solve them, you will find a solution. So you will show that you are able, you are, you are developing your problem solving capacities. You have, you are the leader of your own thesis, so of your own PhD. So it means that you are able to show also your leading capacities. Uh, so at the end, this is what what was appreciated, I would say, in my job and when I applied to the job, the aspect I wanted to show to everybody is that indeed the PhD, it's, it's a professional experience where you, where you are somehow, you have a small company, your own company, yourself, and you do everything in your company. You manage your time schedule, you manage your program, you manage your budget, you manage your contacts, you manage you know, your network, you manage everything. You manage your marketing, how you sell yourself, how you sell your project. So it's, it's just a matter of, uh, indeed, if I can give a very, very important message to all of you is work on yourself. Try really to... To, to see in yourself what you learned, what you developed. You developed a lot of things, so don't limit yourself. Be proud of yourself and, uh, and, and go for it. Network is key. Network is, for me, I think it's one of the most important uh, tool, more than, than a portal uh, for, uh, for people's selection, more than everything. It's, it allows you and we heard it many times before to be in the right place at the right time. Because if you are not there, for sure, you would not be selected. Maybe some very often you would not be selected. But if you are not at the right place, you will not be selected. Yes, yes. Thank, thank you so much for your presentation and the, the, your piece of advice. I think that it is true. Uh, network counts. Uh, maybe more than eighty percent. It counts really a lot when uh, when you are building your career when you are preparing your career and even during your your career. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, it's it, they have to work on the to how to network, but how, how to build a valuable network and how, how to nourish it, how to maintain it, because it is not so easy and you, you, you don't yeah. have to, uh, to take it for granted. It's, it's, it's like a journey, like a journey. it's something in progress, but it, it pays off uh, in a uh, little, it pays in the time. So uh, there is a final question for our panelists. The same way we start again with, with Carol. Tips for early career researchers planning an international mobility. 
Um, yes, that's a very codes also. Sorry. That's a good question. Uh, I would suggest uh, identifying, uh, first of all, uh, research groups in your field you would like to work with uh, and uh, try to list uh, all of them and uh, try also to get in touch uh, with professor or uh, researchers uh, working already in this context. And you can get in touch with them and try to ask uh, questions, uh, first of all, so that uh, you can know uh, a little bit uh, their work uh, and uh, even uh, what are the main rules when applying for an international mobility. So this is my piece of advice. Okay, thank you. And now Alessandro. Ah, we, we cannot hear you. We cannot hear you, Alessandro. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I was uh, yes, I just replied, but uh, in the particular case that you're interested to move in um, in the USA, that is my case, uh, I suggest you to uh, look in details about the different visas because there are very strictly uh, rules and you risk to be uh, kicked out from the country if you don't respect them. And sometimes uh, are not easy at all. For example, uh, the, with the common visa that you have, you cannot apply for uh, a green card or something like that. Otherwise, uh, you cannot work anymore on, on, in the USA. And for sure, you could contact the relocation office uh, of your agency. Um, it's pretty common to have one here that will help you um, under different aspects, for example, taxes or uh, other uh, realities. And moving in a totally different country, such as USA, so uh, very far from your, your home, I suggest you to move several weeks before, before the oh, starting yes. day. <laughs> yeah, to right. prepare. Yeah, you, you have to prepare yourself uh, to the society, not only the work. Be prepared and then keep on And then you can, start work. you can focus on your work. Yeah. Yes, otherwise you are not, you are, you are not uh, ready to work, to start to research, yeah. do research. It, it's... Yeah, of course. Elisa? Uh, they already said two very important tips. What I can stress maybe is that maybe it's easier to go in a research group in which someone in your current research group or past research group, you know someone there. So uh, maybe you could ask to uh, your own network if they know someone in a specific research group in another uh, place that you would like to go so maybe this could make it easier thank you and michael yes uh maybe two things uh, probably be I'm, i would say if you are interested for international experience, uh, there is a lot of opportunities nowadays with uh, with Horizon 2020 and things like this. So, I mean, you can take the leadership on this. You can be the one who promote this and, and have uh, the opportunity maybe to start with, um, I would say, maybe a, an international project that, uh, that, you, can, that you can push. Uh, this is something that for sure have to be evaluated and do not expect, uh, I would say, that your laboratory director know everything about potential opportunities of a collaboration. And secondly, one thing once you are, because I already experienced to move to two different countries, once you move, uh, be patient. You will have up and down. So I, usually at the beginning, everything is great. Then after a while, Everything is not as expected, so be patient. Uh, you need you need time to adapt, uh, and so it's part of uh, of the international experience to have uh, up and down. Yes, you you have to take your time to adapt uh, to understand another 
culture, environment uh, to exactly. get used to. You, you... It's a learning curve, like for everything. So it's a learning curve and it's uh, up and down. Yes. Like but it's always, at the end, it's going, going up, so. <laughs> Any other questions from your side or from the Some audience? Questions? Um, I think maybe we can conclude and go to the final evolution. What would you say? Okay. I think maybe the the last question will be also for all speakers. Would you mind if uh, our participants will get in touch with you uh, if they have more questions on your specific position? Of course. Do it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Do not hesitate. Because you are your professional profiles are all very interesting, different but interesting. So. Uh, this is really a demonstration of the, the, the broad variety of alternative careers for PhD. So to conclude this day, I invite you, our audience to click through me. Ah, yes. Please read in the chat. We have already prepared a, a satisfactory service. So well, first of all, thank you to our speakers for this second round table. Um, for your insights and thank also representatives of, from the previous town round table of, from companies um, for sharing information about your um, background, about the professional world in Italy, in France, and even beyond. It, and it was very fruitful and productive. It was very, with such precious contribution. Thank you for your yeah. really precious contribution, individual precious contribution, I would say, and, and insight. And also for the audience, I invite you to scan the QR code or the, the link that I just put in the chat box. Go on the Klaxoon. The system will ask you just for um, to fill in a nickname. And then you'll see our question questions in the seconds. It will be very quick, will be, but very useful also. It will take for you our... really few, a few minutes, but it will be of great help for us to improve uh, our... Uh, coming edition next year, maybe on site, hopefully on site. Yeah, so the first question is how would you rate your readiness for trying the networking approach when you put one star if you're not ready and five stars if you're ready and gear, eager? Eager. Also, put your uh, feedbacks in the chat box. I already mm -hmm. see some your some of your nice feedbacks. In the in the chat, there are lots of um, thank you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the session were informative, and encouraging. Many thanks from the public. I would like to thank the organizers and speakers for such an interesting for, inform, and for information and tips given. Yeah, so I see what we can all see that there's some, the, the average note is quite good, 4.1. So it's good to start the networking, the, your, to value your readiness for networking. So please continue answering this question. I will move to the second one. Also, the same, how would you rate your knowledge of company expectations and opportunities in the French Italian area? Once again, one star uh, not satisfying, sorry for the typo, mm -hmm. and five stars uh, very, very satisfying. satisfying. And I can see also all of your thanks. And thank you, of course, for your kind messages. Very much important for us also to know whether this um, informational French talent day was um, insightful for you. Well, the average note, well, it's still going up also. Okay. For now, it's 3.6. It's well, it's, yeah. Oh, it's more than um, the average. It's good. 
Uh, so please continue also answering this question and I will just launch the very last question just to see also a little bit of your qualitative feedback. Is this French Italian day for early career researchers just in one word? How would you describe what did you learn from this day or um, uh, whether it's inspired you, um, any word? Interesting, Interesting. <laughs> the first one. Hmm. Enhancing. Enhancing. Informative, inspiring, helpful. Worrying, I hope. Worrying in a good way that you worrying slash motivating. You see network wise, wonderful, helpful, goes on the first place. Reassuring. Okay, well, it's very funny to see that it's, it was in France, worrying yes, and reassuring. Yes. Yeah. Hopefully we could help give them, so I insp inspire, inspire them on how, how to move, to do, to prepare their career, postdoctoral career pack, network-wise. Well, um, the time is up for this uh, year session. So once again, um, well, ABG, the University of Turin, the French Italian University, well, all, uh, and I think also our speakers uh, warmly thank participants and of course our speakers also for, um, for their insights and, um, we're very hoping to receive some of your feedbacks later on. If you have further questions, either to organizers or to speakers, really don't hesitate to network also with us. Um, Lucia, some few yes. last words. Yes. Uh, uh, oh, my gratitude goes to ABG for collaborating with us every year. This is, uh, and hopefully we will keep on collaborating and, and maybe organizing next year. So, uh, finger cross and on site and on site because I believe I strongly believe in network, but I think that it works well when we are on site, and so we we miss we are missing so also these moments like coffee breaks uh, uh, so you can you can do you can you can practice <laughs> uh, when you are a, a network uh, uh, at the beginning of, uh, uh, of this experience and so um, thank you thank you very much to our speakers for the last session and for the previous session because for their for their important contribution for their tips uh, for sharing <clears throat> with us their interesting uh, uh, Path, career postdoctoral career path and demonstrating all the all career paths for PhD. There are really many many career paths for PhD. Interesting, uh, uh, original, uh, and uh, when you are highly skilled, it, it, it always pays off. Absolutely. So thank you all and good luck in your professional uh, career planning Best in France luck. and Italy and beyond. So thank you and goodbye. Bye bye. Bye, bye. everyone. Bye. I do. Ciao. Bye. 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 And ciao. Ciao. Grazie mille.